Hi everybody. I'm Chris Fanta, and um, <laughs> um, I'm not, but um, but I, I wish we were here. Um, unfortunately, he can't be. But um, it's really a pleasure to be able to introduce our asthma grand round speaker, um, uh, Stephanie Shore, who um, I know for a really long time. Um, and when Stephanie first came here, um, she, the first project she did was a project that we did together, working on fish oils um, and in humans and. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the days. <laughs> Those were the days. And, and so Stephanie's got, gone far since then. She's a, a senior lecturer um, at the, um, uh, um, in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences at the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, and um, <clears throat> she got her BSc in Physics and Physiology at McGill in 1979, her PhD in Respiratory Physiology at McGill as well. And when she came here, she was first interested in the innovation of the lung, um, particularly in the role of neuropeptides and substance P um, in their role in airways disease, and then subsequently became interested in the role of smooth muscle in response to beta agonists um, in, in asthma. And then with the increasing obesity um, epidemic, actually became interested in obesity and its impact on the lung. Um, <clears throat> And um, she developed several models, which she's going to talk to you about, in, in mice, um, looking at the effect of obesity in asthma. And she's also transitioned to actually, in regard to obesity, now also looking at the role of the gut microbiome and its role in obesity and changes related to the lung. And so, Stephanie, we're really interested in hearing about this, a lot of this, which is really groundbreaking work and is really very, very important for us in terms of the obesity epidemic. epidemic. So we look forward to learning from you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes, good. Okay. So I have no dis disclosures. Uh, I thought I'd put an outline in just so that you can sort of see where we're going and where we are as we move through the talk. I'm going to begin by telling you a little bit about mostly the epidemiological data related to obesity and asthma. I'm going to describe the pulmonary phenotype of obese mice. Um, I am then going to talk about our data showing that there's a role for the gut microbiome in obesity-related responses to ozone, which is a non-atopic um, um, asthma trigger that we use. And then finally, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about dietary fiber and its role in manipulating the gut microbiome in order to change the responses of the obese mice. Um, so let's just start with obesity as a risk factor for asthma. Um, so what we have learned over, I guess it's about the last 20 years, is that obesity increases the prevalence of asthma. So this is mostly from epidemiological work. And here's one of these studies. At a certain point, I lost count. When it got up to 150 of these studies, I stopped counting. Um, but this particular study is uh, data from the National Center for Health Statistics in the United States. Um, and what you're looking at here um, is just the percent of subjects who had asthma. This is all subjects, men and women. And the different colors just indicate whether the subjects are lean or obese. So lean is here, this is overweight, this is obese. And so what you can see is that in the obese group, there's an increased prevalence of asthma. And that if you look over here, most of that is coming from the women in the study rather than the men. There's a small effect in men. And most studies report a similar small effect in men, but really a very marked effect in women. Um, there's also data showing differences in the prevalence of obesity um, in subjects who have severe asthma. So this is just data from uh, the Tenor study, which is, I believe, a US study of severe asthma. And what you're looking at in this box right here, this is children, this is ad adolescents and adults. This is the prevalence of obesity in severe asthmatic children. And just for comparison, that's the prevalence of obesity in the general US population. So you can see higher prevalence in the obese asthmatic kids. And then over here, um, this is adults. So 57% of adults who have severe asthma are obese. And that's compared to about 35% of the general asthma, uh, sorry, the general US population. And this just is to show you the same thing applies if you look elsewhere in the world. This is a, a British study of severe asthma. And so again, um, in these severe asthmatics, 48% of them are obese. In the UK, the general population, 25% are obese. So again, 
a big sort of over um, um, abundance of uh, obese people within the severe population. Now, all of this is just association, right? It doesn't tell you anything about whether this is causal or not. Um, when we started to get a little bit more towards causal, um, it began with this study right here, which described the incidence of asthma in the obese. And this was the study that actually got me inter interested in this um, whole topic. So this is a study from Carlos Camargo, um, which was part of the nurse's health study uh, with Frank Spicer and Scott Weiss, I think. Um, and what you're seeing here is just the relative risk of asthma in this group of something like 75,000 nurses as a function of body mass index. And so in this study, they started with people who were initially not asthmatic. They went forward five years and asked people again, has a doctor ever told you that you had asthma? They got some yeses now where they had had all no's previously. So those were incident cases of asthma. And then they looked at the person's initial BMI, so the BMI before they became asthmatic. And that's what's on this uh, x-axis right here. And you can see that for the people who were obese initially, um, they were more likely to have a diagnosis of asthma than the people who were lean initially. And again, this has been reproduced in uh, uh, not hundreds, but uh, certainly 20 to 30 different such large um, prospective studies. Um, then, you know, to really kind of get at the idea of is this causal or not, um, there's data showing that weight loss improves asthma outcomes. And so I'm going to show you a study um, from Ann Dixon and her colleagues at the University of Vermont. And what Ann did was she um, went to the bariatric surgery unit and she screened people who were going for bariatric surgery. Um, and she studied them, she phenotyped them before, and then 12 months after they had had weight loss surgery. And what you're seeing here on the y-axis is just the PC20. So uh, high is good, less asthmatic. Um, and this is before and after the surgery. And they lost order of magnitude um, 10 to 20 kilos over this period of time. Um, so what was interesting here was that if you look at the subjects who were non-atopic, um, you can see that in those subjects, there was a fairly marked improvement in their airway responsiveness after they lost weight. Um, but if you look over here at the people who were atopic, you can see that in these people, there really wasn't anything happening with respect to weight loss. Um, so Anne's conclusion from this study was that in this group of people, the people who are non-atopic, that the subjects are actually, their, their asthma is actually being caused by the obesity. And that if you take away the obesity or make the obesity better, um, their asthma improves. In this group of subjects, their asthma is most likely related to their atopy. They're allergic asthmatics. The um, obesity um, may make their symptoms worse, but it isn't causal with respect to their asthma. Um, then um, just to sort of, sort of round this out a little bit in, in terms of the idea of atopy and non-atopy, um, this is just a summarized data from the first study um, in which they did a cluster analysis of asthma. And within that study, they identified either four or five different asthmatic clusters. And one of them was this cluster of obese asthmatics. And I just wanted to point out a few things about these, this group of subjects. So first of all, they typically have a late onset type of asthma. They are predominantly female, as was referenced on that very first slide that I showed you. They have high levels of symptoms, but they have very little atopy and typically low eosinophils. So they're not allergic. They're not atopic. Um, and then moderate airway responsiveness. And this is important. They, they tend to be less responsive to typical controller medications like steroids. Um, this is basically now just the same kind of data. This is a cluster analysis done on severe asthmatics um, from the UK. And again, I just wanted you to note these two things here, that they're typically female and that they typically have low ATP. Um, and in this particular case, they also required typically more steroids, 
probably because they were less responsive to those steroids. Um, so as this kind of data started to develop, I got really, really interested in the problem. Um, and in particular, the fact that there really wasn't a whole lot that we could do for these people um, with the typical treatments that we have available to us because they don't seem to respond to them as well as other types of asthmatics. Um, and so I moved into thinking about, well, if we're going to figure out how this happens, we're going to probably need animal models. And so um, that brings me to my next topic, which is just um, the phenotype of a typical obese mouse. Um, and we began with this mouse right here, which is an ob ob mouse, right, right there. And this mouse and this mouse differ uh, by one base pair. Uh, that base pair uh, codes for a premature stop codon in the leptin gene. For those of you who don't know what leptin is, leptin is a satiety hormone. Um, and in the absence of functional leptin, these guys eat voraciously. Um, they uh, also have a low metabolic rate. And by the time they are uh, eight weeks old, they typically weigh 60 to 65 grams. So for those of you who play with mice, you know how fat that is. That's a very obese mouse. Um, and this guy is the brother of this guy. Um, so here is just some data showing airway responsiveness in these mice. So we didn't do anything to them. We didn't sensitize them or challenge them. All we did was simply anesthetize them, instrument them for the measurement of airway responsiveness, and that's what you're seeing here. So this is pulmonary resistance um, as a function of methacholine. And in this case, I believe this is intravenous methacholine. Since then, we've switched and mostly used aerosolized methacholine. So these are the wild type, the lean mice right here. And you can see the typical increase in pulmonary resistance that happens when you give them methacholine. Um, whereas if you look now at these obese mice, and you can see that there's a much bigger increase in resistance, and that's basically the definition of airway hyperresponsiveness. So they are innately airway hyperresponsive. Um, so when we got this data initially, one of the questions that was asked a lot was, okay, is this because they're obese, or is this because they don't have leptin, right? And so what we did was we looked at a whole bunch of other animal models that vary um, in terms of how they become obese. So here's four different types. These are the, that's the data that I just showed you. So these are similar data in DBDB mice. So these mice do have leptin, but they don't have the leptin receptor genetically. And again, you can see they're hyper-responsive. Um, these guys up here are called CPE fat mice. They have leptin. They have lots of leptin um, because they're obese. And typically, obese mice have lots of leptin. Um, and these mice are obese because they lack carboxypeptidase, which is involved in processing neuropeptides that are related to eating behaviors. They're also hyper-responsive. And then down here, these are mice that have been made obese as a result of putting them on a high-fat diet. They really, really like this food. And as you can see here, they also become um, hyper-responsive. So these two mice over here have lots of leptin, uh, are fat, are hyper-responsive. These two mice over here either don't have leptin or can't respond to it. They're also fat. They also have hyper-responsiveness. So it doesn't seem to be related to leptin. It's more, much more likely to be related to the obesity per se. Um, but, you know, most asthma doesn't sort of happen all the time. It kind of comes and goes, usually in response to triggers. Um, and so as we were thinking about this and thinking about the human data, we looked for a trigger that would be a non-atopic trigger because the phenotype is more, at least the phenotype that responds to weight loss is more of a non-atopic phenotype. And so we started to use ozone for this purpose. So ozone is just a, a pollutant that's produced when um, you have automobile exhaust in the presence of sunlight. Um, and what we know about it is that on days when the ambient ozone concentrations are high, there's more emergency room visits for asthma. If you give ozone to humans in chamber studies, it causes asthma symptoms, it causes airway hyperresponsiveness. Um, and in humans, um, these ozone-induced symptoms and the decrements in lung function that result from ozone exposure 
are greater if the subjects are obese than if they're lean. And we see the same thing in mice. So here is, these are now DBDB mice, so very obese. And what you're looking at here now is both air and ozone exposed animals. And so just to start you off, this is, these are the air mice. So these are the lean ones, these are the obese mice. And you can see that innate airway hyperresponsiveness that I talked about before. When you expose the lean mice to ozone, this is now the airway responsiveness. So tiny increase, looks tinier because I had to put it on a scale that allowed me to put the obese mice in here. So what happens with the obese mice um, is, first of all, they get an increase just in their baseline resistance. You don't have to give them methacholine. They just have airway obstruction as a result of the ozone exposure, whereas the lean mice, that doesn't happen. And then when you give them methacholine, you can see that their airway responsiveness is now much, much greater um, than the change in airway responsiveness that occurs in the lean mice. In um, obese mice and, and in lean mice, um, the inflammation that you get in response to ozone is primarily neutrophilic. And so this is just indicating how many neutrophils are in the bowel fluid. So there's air, there's ozone. These are the lean mice, and you can see that increase with ozone. But in the obese mice, you get more neutrophils. You also get more of a whole variety of cytokines and chemokines. Um, you know, you could pick your favorite one here, um, but let's just sort of pick IL-6. And you can see that with ozone, bal IL-6 goes up, and here's the lean ones and here's the obese ones, and you can see that it goes up a lot more in the obese ones. So there's greater uh, effects of ozone, greater airway responsiveness, greater increases in obstruction, greater neutrophils, greater cytokines and chemokines in the obese mice than in the lean mice. Um, so this is the model that we've mostly been working with. And what I'm going to now do is move on and tell you a little bit about the role of the gut microbiome in this phenotype that I've just described to you. And so the first question you may have is, why look at the gut microbiome? Um, and so part of the answer to that is that it seems to play a role in allergic forms of asthma, and so maybe it plays a role in other forms of asthma. These are uh, data that were published in 2010, and I believe that this was one of the first studies in mice that demonstrated a role for the microbiome in um, allergic mouse models. And what these people did was they sensitized and challenged mice with, uh, it was, pro oh, it's OVA. Um, and so what you're seeing here, these are just regular mice that live in standard, um, specific pathogen-free environments. Um, and so the OVA causes increases in eosinophils, as it usually does. What's interesting here is that if the mice are germ-free, you get a lot more eosinophils. So these are mice that don't have a microbiome. But if you recolonize these mice with microbiota from these mice, then these mice look like these mice. So there's clearly something about the microbiome that plays a role in allergic asthma. Second reason, the microbiome, the gut microbiome is different in, obese, in obesity than in uh, lean. These are data, I think this is the very first study that was published of this type of data. It's been reproduced many times, both in mice and in people. Um, and so what you're looking at here is uh, the same OBOB mice I talked about before. These are the litter mates of these guys, but they're lean, so they are a normal C57 black 6 mice. And these are heterozygous mice, which are also lean. And what you're looking at here is just uh, the percentage of um, total sequences that they isolate from fecal pellets. Um, uh, that are part of these two different bacterial phyla, the most common phyla that, that exist in, in the typical fecal pellet. And what you can see here is that in these obese mice, there's an increase in, I never know how to say this, firmicutes, and uh, a reduction in bacteroidetes. And this same sort of thing, we've seen, many, many other people have seen it. You don't have to have it be an OB mouse, it can be a DB mouse, a mouse with dietary-induced asthma they always have this sort of change in their gut microbiome. 
The other piece of information that sort of led us down this path towards looking at the microbiome um, was this study by Paul Kenny and his group. And what you're looking at here is the IL-1 mRNA uh, expression in adipose tissue. Um, and in this case, it's from normal control mice that are on regular uh, mouse chow and, and mice that are on a high-fat diet and that are obese. And so what you can see here in these two groups is that the mice with obesity have increased adipose tissue inflammation, which is classic, a classic phenomena that you find in obesity. Um, what you're seeing here and here is what happens when you put these mice on antibiotics, oral antibiotics, and I believe it was a cocktail. In the lean mice, really nothing happened. But in the obese mice, what you see is that that adipose tissue inf inflammation is essentially gone once these animals have had their gut microbiome zapped by giving them high doses of antibiotics. And there's data also looking at a variety of other obesity-related phenotypes like uh, cerebral infarctions, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, fatty liver disease. In all of these cases, the obesity-related change in the microbiome seems to be playing a role in um, whatever the obesity-related disease is that you're looking at. Um, the other sort of piece of information that you need to know is that when we started this sort of endeavor, we didn't initially begin with obese mice, in part because I can't afford to do so. They're very expensive mice. And so we started with the lean mice. And so what you're seeing here is just airway responsiveness in these are lean male mice um, that we treated either with water or antibiotics uh, for two weeks via their drinking water. Um, and what you can see here is that nothing happened in terms of the air exposure. If we give the mice ozone, these are ozone-exposed mice that had been on regular water for two weeks, there is an increase in airway responsiveness. And if we give the mice antibiotics before we expose them to ozone, that change in airway responsiveness comes down. So when I first started talking about these data, the, the response that everybody said was, yeah, but you know, antibiotics do things that are not really specific necessarily. And so how do you know that this is really about the microbiome and not about some nonspecific you know, change that's happened as a result of these antibiotics? And so I thought, yeah, that's a reasonable comment. And so what we did is we went and got some germ-free mice. Um, and we studied their response to ozone. And so this is just the response of regular SPF mice, and this is the response of the germ-free mice. And you can see that that same phenomena that we saw in the antibiotic-treated mice, you also see in mice that just don't have um, a microbiome. And if you look at the changes in neutrophils, you see the same thing. So Here's the response of the, of the normal mice to ozone. So you have an increase in neutrophils with ozone. Um, and if the animals were on antibiotics, fewer neutrophils. These are flipped backwards, but these are the normal mice and these are the germ-free mice. Um, so regardless of whether you get rid of your microbiome with antibiotics or you get rid of it by having germ-free conditions, the neutrophilic response to ozone goes down. Um, so then we said, okay, well, seems to be playing a role even in a normal mouse, so um, it, it is a reasonable thing to ask whether obesity-related changes in the gut microbiome might be contributing to obesity-related increases in the response to ozone. And so uh, we did the same kind of thing. We put mice on antibiotics or on regular drinking water. And so here are the deep, now the fat mice, um, here is air, and here is ozone. So everybody now is going to be obese. Um, and these mice were uh, given just regular drinking water. Um, when we gave the air-exposed mice antibiotics, there was a small trend towards it going up, but it wasn't significant. When we gave the ozone-exposed mice antibiotics, uh, there was a reduction in the response. And in fact, it was reduced not back all the way to what the lean mice were, was, but if you sort of look at these curves, the air and the ozone-exposed mice, there's actually no difference until you get out to really high doses of methacholine. So it had a fairly substantial impact. 
Okay, so same question though, right? We have how do you know it's the antibiotics zapping the microbiome as opposed to some other effect of the antibiotics? A little bit harder to ask this question in an obese mouse because germ-free mice typically don't get very obese. Um, and so we did a different experiment in sort of in order to find a different way of looking at the question, which was that we did fecal transplant experiments. And I'll show you the protocol here so you get an idea. So we started with mice that were germ-free. And we either gave them uh, a gavage with feces from lean wild-type mice or we gave them a gavage with feces from obese um, mice. And then we waited two weeks in order to allow these microbiota to implant in the, uh, in the gut. And we measured airway responsiveness. I just realized that I forgot to say something very important. So I'm going to skip back to it, um, which is, and this is a question I usually get, how do you know this is the gut microbiome, right? That's the question. How do you know this is not the lung microbiome? It may make, more, make more sense if it was the lung microbiome. Um, the way that we know is that this is basically a cocktail of antibiotics. Um, and when we looked at each of the individual antibiotics by themselves, um, most of them worked. Some of them didn't. One of the ones that worked when we gave it all by itself was vancomycin. Now, vancomycin, when you give it orally, doesn't usually get across the gut epithelium. And people have shown that vancomycin administered orally doesn't change the lung microbiome in mice. It most certainly does change the gut microbiome. And it had the same effect as what you're seeing here. So it doesn't seem to be the lung microbiome. It's much more likely that this is the gut microbiome. The reason I needed to tell you is that we did some measurements of gut microbiome. But before we get there, um, so we measured airway responsiveness and we collected bowel fluid from these mice. We also collected a fecal pellet just before we did the exposure in these mice. And so this is the body weight of these two groups of mice. Okay, so they all started out lean. They had these, uh, this gavage, and then two weeks later, this was their body weight. So the body weight didn't change as a result of this fecal transplant. Uh, the gut microbiome most certainly did change. Uh, this is a principal component analysis, basically, which is just reducing the very multidimensional data that you get from 16S sequencing of the fecal pellets uh, down to three components. And what you see here are the donor mice, uh, sorry, the mice that got um, a fecal transplant from wild type lean donors and the mice that got a fecal transplant from the DB donors, and you can see they're separated, which indicates they have a different microbiome. Um, when we looked at the um, air-exposed mice, um, so these are, again, they're all germ initially germ-free mice. They're all lean mice. They either got feces from a normal wild-type mouse or from a DB mouse. That didn't change the response to air. So that innate airway hyperresponsiveness that I talked about at the beginning, that doesn't seem to be dependent on the gut microbiome. Um, but the response to ozone does. Uh, so this is where the response to ozone was in the mice that got the lean um, uh, feces. And these were the mice that got the obese feces. So you can see greater ozone-induced airway hyperresponsiveness in the mice that got the obese feces. Um, there were also greater numbers of neutrophils in the mice that got the obese feces. This is just an index of uh, the injury that occurs in response to ozone. And you can see that that's also greater in the mice that got the obese feces. And then again, pick your favorite cytokine. Um, here's the air. Here's the ozone. Let's just look at eotaxin, because it's up here in the top corner. Um, and what you can see here is that ozone makes these cytokines go up. And there's a whole bunch of them that go up. Um, and they go up more if, the, if they got the fecal transplant from the obese donor. So um, here's the phenotype of the obese mice. They're greater body weight. They have a different microbiome. And all of these outcome indicators that relate to the response to ozone are higher in the obese mice, normal obese mice, than in lean mice. Here are the germ-free mice that either get 
the obese feces or the lean feces. They are not obese. They do have a different gut microbiome, and they resemble real obese mice in all of these features of the response to ozone. Um, so the net sort of um, conclusion from that is that an obese gut microbiome is sufficient all by itself, even without causing obesity, to augment pulmonary responses to ozone and basically to create something that looks like an obese mouse in terms of its phenotype, even though the mouse isn't actually obese. Um, so last bit about dietary fiber. Um, you know, having done these, these experiments, you know, I look and I say, wow, if we could treat people with antibiotics, maybe we could make their obese asthma get better. But I don't think anybody's ever going to be a proponent of chronically putting obese people on antibiotics to make their asthma better. Um, and so the question is, what else could we do to manipulate the gut microbiome? Um, and so there's usually two ways that people think about. One is to give probiotics, so these are live beneficial bacteria. The other way is to use prebiotics. So these are foods that change the gut microbiome. And that was the way that we decided to go. Um, and in particular, we decided to use changes in dietary fiber. Um, and the reason that we went down that road is, first of all, that there was data in the literature that said that dietary fiber has the capacity to impact body weight. Now, we did a three-day fiber challenge, so obviously didn't wait long enough for that to happen, you'll see. Um, the second piece of data was that other um, obese phenotypes, like type 2 diabetes, um, are improved uh, by giving dietary fiber. And uh, fiber also attenuates the hypertension and risk of heart failure that are associated with obesity. Um, fiber changes the gut microbiome. So these are data from um, Trompet et al., from Ben Marsland's group, who is now, I believe, in Australia. And he did two different types of dietary fiber manipulation. One was he took regular mice and had them on control, sort of standard mouse chow diets, uh, or he had them on diets with low fiber. Um, and all the different colors here just represent different, I think this is down to the genus level, so different taxa of bacteria, so a stacked graph. And you can see, you don't have to do statistics to see with your eyes that low fiber has a big impact on the gut microbiome. Um, and then over here, we have cellulose-rich diets versus pectin-rich diets. I'll say more a little bit. They're both types of fiber, but they vary in terms of their function. And you can see that with these two types of diets, you also have a change in the gut microbiome. Um, so our hypothesis was simply that dietary fiber could change the gut microbiome, as you've just seen, and thereby impact obesity-related responses um, to ozone. So we use two different types of fiber. We use cellulose and pectin. So cellulose is the typical fiber that you find in vegetables. It's insoluble. It's unfermentable. Um, the other fiber that we used was uh, pectin. So pectin is more typically found in fruits like apples. It is a soluble fiber, and it is fermentable. And what we did was we brought in normal um, DB and wild-type mice. So we bought them from Jackson Labs. The first week that they were with us, we had them just on a, a control diet with a, a low concentration of cellulose and pectin. And then after they had been in our facility for a week, we switched them to either having a cellulose-rich diet or a pectin-rich diet. Um, we waited three days. And uh, we took a fecal pellet at this point in time. And then we exposed them um, to air or to ozone and did our usual measurements. And so this is just to show you that the pectin and cellulose do indeed change the gut microbiome. Um, you're seeing four groups of animals here. So these are the two lean groups, and these are the two obese groups. And so you can see there's a big difference between lean and obese, um, but also these are pectin-fed mice. These are cellulose-fed mice. So you can see that there is an impact of these two fibers in lean mice, 
But in the obese mice, that impact of, of the fiber diets is really, really different um, and, and greatly magnified. Um, so when we looked at responses to air, so what's down here are the two different lean groups with pectin and cellulose. And what's here are the two different obese groups with pectin and cellulose. And you can see that typical innate airway hyperresponsiveness that's characteristic of, of obese mice. But you can also see that the diet doesn't affect that at all. Um, so here now is what happens with ozone. So there's actually two groups of mice on here, but they look so much the same that they're overlapping and you can't see the difference. So these are the lean mice with, with either fed pectin or cellulose. Um, in the obese mice, these are the ones that were fed cellulose. These are the ones that were fed pectin. And so you can see that there is a reduction in the response to ozone. It doesn't bring it all the way down to the lean values. But we only gave them three days in order to see this change. Um, and when we looked at neutrophils, you see the same thing. So here's that big increase in neutrophils that you see in the DB mice compared to the lean mice. And here's what happens in cellulose versus pectin. So the pectin improved the airway responsiveness. It also improved um, the influx of neutrophils. Um, so the question, of course, is how does this happen? Um, so we examined a bunch of different things, um, none of which worked, um, and finally started to think about um, gut immunity because there's a lot of information in the literature about how the gut microbiome, in fact, in, impacts the immune response in the gut. Um, and so this is just, you know, a cartoon to remind me to tell you that, not that I want you to go through the specifics of this. But there was also a really interesting paper um, that came out um, right around the time that we were initially thinking about doing these experiments um, that was looking at um, uh, a fungal infection in the lung. And what these people showed was that the concentration of IL-17 in the lungs, these are both groups of mice given fungus, um, was that if they treated the mice with vancomycin, you can see that there was a really big reduction in IL-17 in the lung. Um, and this is basically just dividing up the cells and noticing that it's the CD4 positive cells that are the ones that uh, their production of IL-17 was reduced. And remember, Vancomycin is affecting, the, it was given via the drinking water, so it's affecting the gut, but it isn't affecting the lung microbiome. And yet, it's very strongly affecting the IL-17 in the lung. Um, now, the reason that we were interested in that is that we had data um, showing that there were changes in IL-17 in the lung um, with ozone exposure. So here's ozone, here's air, and this is lean mice, and this is obese mice. So the obese mice have greater IL-17 in their lungs after ozone. We also knew um, that airway responsiveness was, was affected by this IL-17. So here, these are all ozone-exposed mice. Um, these two black groups here, one is uh, given an isotype antibody, the other one is given anti-IL-17. Doesn't do anything to airway responsiveness in the lean mice. In the obese mice, here's the one that got the isotype antibody, and you see that typical, much greater response to ozone that's typical of these obese mice. And if we give them anti-IL-17, it reduces their response to ozone. Um, and so we knew that IL-17 probably mattered, so we went and looked at IL-17 in these mice that were on the pectin and cellulose diets. And um, here's the air, here's the ozone-exposed mice. This is just Val-IL-17 that we were measuring. And what you can see is that here's the two uh, groups of obese mice. And compared to the lean mice, the cellulose-treated group, which is also the group that had the greater airway responsiveness, also has greater amounts of IL-17. And if we treated these mice instead of giving them pectin, sorry, cellulose in their diet, if we gave them pectin in their diet, and change their microbiome, it also changed their IL-17 in their lungs. And so the way that we think that um, these diets are working is that typically obesity is leading to changes in the gut microbiome. 
that's causing changes in the immune response in the gut, but maybe also in the lung, um, leading to increases in lung IL-17, and that that seems to be contributing to airway hyperresponsiveness. Um, if we give animals pectin, um, we definitely change their microbiome. Um, and that seems to change immune responses so that their lung IL-17 goes down and their airway responsiveness goes down. Um, so the conclusion from this part of the study is just that dietary fiber has the capacity um, to protect against obesity-related increases in pulmonary responses to ozone, um, perhaps as a result of microbial modulation of the immune system. Um, the, the reason I find this kind of interesting is that, having done it myself many times, weight loss is hard to do. Um, but it may not be as hard to ask somebody to cause a little change in their diet, adding a couple pieces of fruit. Um, and so it's, you know, it's feasible that we might be able to find ways to manipulate diets so that we may be able to impact obese asthma. Obviously, this is mice, it's not people, but it's at least, uh, you know, supporting the idea that, might, that that might be an effective um, change. Um, so I just wanted to, to end by thanking all the people who did that work. Um, a lot of this work was done by Hiroshi, uh, uh, sorry, Hiroki Toshiro, who was a fellow in my lab who's now gone back. He's a faculty member in Japan. Um, Helen Cho did uh, a lot of the work with antibiotics uh, in lean mice that I showed you. Uh, David Kasahara was uh, mainly involved in the, in the studies in the obese mice. Roz Osgood, who's in the room here, um, helped out um, uh, both in the obese mouse studies uh, and in some other work that we're doing looking at sex differences. And then Jeffrey Brand, Joel Matthews, Alini Cardoza all participated in some way. Um, we were very uh, thankful to the group at the Massachusetts Host Microbiome Center, which is over in the same building uh, across the street, kind of right next to the Channing. Um, they have a germ free facility for mice. Uh, and then uh, we have a really great group of um, gut microbiome uh, bioinformatics experts at the School of Pub Public Health, led by Curtis Huttenhauer. And they have been really helpful in helping us to analyze 6 nest sequencing data from mice. Um, and that's it. <clears throat> um, I was just going to remind people who are on the webinar that if you want to submit a question, you can text me at 617-645-0504. Um, Stephanie, that was a wonderful um, synthesis and a really interesting story in terms of development of the obesity-related um, changes in airway hyperresponsiveness. So it'll take questions. And So we are in the process of doing that. It's, it's a really interesting but really complicated story. So in lean mice, if you are a female mouse, you have a smaller response to ozone than if you're a male mouse. If you are an obese mouse, then the female mice have greater responses to ozone than the male mice. It does seem like at least some of that is related to both sex-related differences in the microbiome and how obesity changes the gut microbiome in males versus females. The second question I had was, I just had a chance to look at the metabolism uh, and if there's any potential metabolomics in the first mice. So we've done a lot of metabolomics in lean mice that we've given antibiotics and non, and there's sort of two things that pop out of that. Um, so one is bile acids. Um, that are higher in mice given ozone that have been treated with antibiotics. Um, the second one is just lipids, fatty acids in general, which typically increase in response to ozone. Um, but if you're given antibiotics, that doesn't happen anymore. Other questions? Um, I had a question. Um, so there, there is a fair amount of relationship between IL-6 and obesity. What role do you think IL-6 plays in what you're seeing? Well, I don't 
No, we've done a little bit of work with anti-IL-6 and found that it certainly reduces the sort of hyper uh, recruitment of neutrophils that you get in obese mice with ozone. It doesn't seem to affect their airway responsiveness. Um, IL-6 can be one of the things that sort of pushes towards IL-17 production. Mm -hmm. And it's conceivable that that's what's going on, but uh, that's a guess. It's, we don't have any data to support that that's the answer. And then, please. So even with the improvement of kind of oxygenation by the source, the obese mice are still taking out the fat. To, to. The matter of I'm just going to repeat the question for people on the webinar. So the question was, um, do we think that we could improve um, the response of obese mice to alternaria um, with these changes in the diet? Okay, so two things to, to say about that. First of all, the impact of obesity on allergic models of asthma is very different than the impact on responses to ozone. There is... Uh, like, we've, we've done work with uh, ovalbumin. Other people have done work with house dust mite. Um, I don't know, of, maybe you've done, but I don't know of anybody doing stuff with alternaria. Um, so typically what happens is that the allergen-induced airway hyperresponsiveness gets worse in the obese mice, but the inflammation really doesn't change, or if anything, is better in the obese mice than the lean mice. No, I mean how many eosinophils come into the lung, the type 2 cytokines that come into the lung, um, paradoxically, are better, not worse, in the obese mice. Um, so the other thing is that the role of the microbiome in allergic responses seems to be very different than the role of the microbiome in responses to ozone. What, I, what I've been showing you is that taking away the gut microbiome makes everything better in terms of the response to ozone. But the very first slide that I showed you showed that if you take away the microbiome in, in, a, in an allergic model, everything got worse. So whatever the microbiome is doing, it's behaving very differently depending on whether you're looking at an allergic model versus a non-allergic model. Um, Stephanie, um, do you, so with these changes that have produced these changes in the response to ozone, um, have you been able to identify um, any uh, products that you think are actually affecting these changes? What, what are, what in the microbiome are there particular, this relates a little bit to the metabolomics, yeah. is, are, are there products that suggest that they may be down-regulating this response? So as I said, this sort of metabolomics data that we have is suggesting lipids, in particular bile acids and right. fatty acids. Um, but the only sort of in terms of like which bacteria is, right. is the answer and what does that bacterium do, there, there seems to be a really good relationship between, excuse me, whether the animals are responding to ozone or not and the presence of this taxa called Teresibacter in their gut. There's not a lot of data in the literature about Teresibacter and exactly what it does. So I sort of think that the next frontier in, in all of this kind of work, not just with asthma, but in the microbiome in general, is really to start generating libraries of all the various bacteria that are present and what they can do, but also to put them together because often when bacteria are by themselves, they do one thing, and if you put them with other guys, who offer them different uh, substrates to work with, they can do something else. Um, we really need, that's where we really need to start thinking. And as lactobacillus has been shown to reduce the allergen response, does that play any role here that you see? So it doesn't seem to play any role in the obese mice, but it does seem to relate to the, what, what we were talking about before, which is the sex difference role. Hmm. Their lactobacillus does seem to play a different role. Right, any other? Um, yes and yes. Um, so um, Nandini and I are right in the middle of an analyzing a, a very large data set from air and ozone exposed, obese and lean, male and female mice. 
looking at their lungs, looking at all the various lymphoid cells in the lungs, particularly with respect to the production of type 2 cytokines and to the production of IL-17. And so I can give you a few little snippets of that data. So the first one is that obese mice have, when they're exposed to ozone, compared to lean mice exposed to ozone, they have higher numbers of innate lymphoid cells in their lungs, and they have higher numbers of IL-13 producing gamma delta T cells in their lungs. Mm. Um, the data with IL-17, correct me if I'm wrong, um, indicates that surprisingly, at least it was surprising to me, the cells that are making the IL-17 when we give them ozone are macrophages, or else they're a macrophage-like cell. Um, and th that was news to me when we discovered that, but that seems to be what it is. As far as the microbiome and how the IL-17 ch changes there with diet, we haven't looked at that yet in terms of cell types. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Stephanie. Thank you again for a wonderful